exclude this witness. And I have some reasons for it, but um, I'll also defer to the state. Judge, do you believe that Thorny Young's guiding principle should be followed and would the district committee be justified in excluding this witness on numerous grounds? And we might have to state those grounds. We don't believe, first of all, he would be qualified even if you determined that his testimony or testimony of an expert would be um, applicable. I don't see where the, the Daubert standard was even approached or satisfied by Mr. Corolla's questioning of this witness. Um, I don't think that his experience, while his experience has been very good in some areas, it has nothing to do with this type of case or this type of defendant. His primary work for several decades was with juveniles working for the Department of HRS, and while he's a very nice man and has a very good heart, um, his degrees are in theology, he does a lot of counseling, and I believe that counseling someone who has experienced acute stress is is a great uh, deal different than being able to aid this jury, and that's the standard I believe this court has to apply. We don't believe his testimony can aid this jury that they are perfectly capable of determining whether this defendant's actions following the shooting are consistent with the state's theory that it was flight to avoid prosecution or the defendant's theory that he was catering to his girlfriend. All right. Um, as everybody knows, we are now under the Daubert standard as opposed to the Fry, which was the prior uh, case law in, in this kind of a matter. And I believe that it is harder actually to get this type of testimony admitted under Daubert than it was under Fry. Mr. Strolla cited the Mizell case, which is a post-traumatic stress syndrome case, um, actually pretty local because it involved Dr. Kropp, who I'm familiar with and I'm sure the rest of the attorneys here are. Uh, but the testimony that was discussed in that case was, as I said, about post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and whether the uh, doctor could testify about that in a second-degree murder case where the, there was an issue of self-defense. Um, and so it went to the actual defense itself. Uh, and that case said it was not admissible to the issue of diminished capacity, um, but it was relevant to self-defense. This uh, the court there said that they were the state when they were arguing was incorrect in characterization of the PTSD as diminished capacity evidence. The appellate court viewed the PTSD evidence offered in the case as state of mind evidence, quite analogous to a battered wife syndrome, or excuse me, battered spouse syndrome testimony that had been approved previously. Um, and that that type of testimony had been admitted in support of a claim of self-defense. So that case is a self-defense case, and that is not the purpose for which um, Mr. Strolla has indicated he wants to offer um, – I've forgotten the man's name now – the doctor's – Mr. Abuso's testimony. Um, doing some quick research and uh, – Got to commend uh, our law clerks, particularly Maria. Um, I found a couple of cases. One goes to uh, the qualifications of the proposed witness, and he has never been declared to be an expert. And I recognize there's a case that says there's always a first time. He has, there's no testimony of any publications, no peer reviews. He's never spoken to the defendant himself about this incident. 
There's a case of Humble versus State, which is a First District Court of Appeal case, 652 Southern 2nd, 1213, um, where the court held that a witness's 17-year experience working in the field of domestic violence, operating shelters, and domestic violence programs, attending and teaching workshops on spouse abuse was insufficient to qualify her as a witness for the purpose of describing battered wife syndrome. The uh, Daubert requires certain things, uh, an analysis of relevancy and reliability. The re reliability aspect of it, from what I can see, is broken down into two areas. It's kind of discussed in Hood versus uh, Matrix Incentives at 50 Southern 3rd, 1166. And it seems that the reliability analysis takes two um, tracks. One is about the underlying methodology, I guess the science, and the second is the application of that to the facts of the particular case. And while I recognize that <clears throat> acute stress disorder seems to be something that is recognized, it's the application to this case that, that causes the court some difficulty. Uh, and then, uh, just for the record, there's a case of State versus Nazario, N-A-Z-A-R-I-O, which is somewhat helpful. Uh, that's 726 Southern 2nd, 349. But the most telling case is the case of Zile versus State at 779-535. Um, this was a case where a proffered expert's testimony concerning alleged acute stress disorder suffered by the defendant as a result of having killed his daughter was not relevant. The case goes on to talk about that the defendant offered the witness and the witness's testimony to the effect that his conduct after the child's death was the result of that person's, and now they've shifted it over and called it post-traumatic stress disorder, resulting from the child's death at his hands. And so I think it's very, very uh, on point because it deals with the defendant's conduct after the offense, which is exactly what we're talking about here, Mr. Dunn's conduct after the offense. And in that case, and this was a um, second DCA case, the second district agreed with the trial judge that the expert testimony of any acute distress disorder suffered by the appellant as a result of having killed the child was not relevant um, to assist the jury in understanding the evidence of how or why he affected the death of the child. So I guess as they say under the Daubert case, as pursuant to my gatekeeping duties and for the reasons I just stated in the cases I cited, uh, I'm going to sustain the state's objection to calling Thank you, Mr. Abuso, or Dr. Abuso, uh, as a witness. And further, I believe that there is testimony before the jury as to why Mr. Dunn did what he did, um, that obviously the defense can make their argument about, just as the state can make their counter argument as to why Mr. Dunn may have done what he did. And it is my understanding that Mr. Dunn is actually going to testify, and so he, I'm sure, is going to offer more testimony as to why he acted the way he did after the fact. And so that issue then, in my mind, would be sufficiently before the jury. It's an issue that uh, they would not need expert testimony on to decide uh, 
and understand or come to some conclusion as to why he did what he did, recognizing that while all of that's great, the state may call it flight and the defense may call it uh, a reaction to a, a terribly stressful situation, it really does get us away from the ultimate fact, and that is, was this shooting and killing justifiable or excusable in some way, shape, or form? And that's what this case is going to boil down to. So uh, with that said, Mr. Strolla, what is your position on your next witness? All right, then. Go ahead. No, no. Let me just let me clarify. That Zyl case was the testimony was being offered to explain the conduct of the defendant after he had killed his daughter. And what happened there was he apparently killed his daughter um, after her death. He did not notify the authorities because of his concern over the bruises on her body. The next day, he wrapped the body in a blanket and hid it in a closet for several days in order that the other children in the home would not discover the dead child. He instigated a missing child report and a public plea claiming that the child had been kidnapped. He purchased a shovel, a tarpaulin, and other items in order to bury her body. He wrapped the body, secured it with duct tape, dug a hole, and buried it in a place he had previously chosen. He disposed of the shovel by throwing it off a bridge, and so obviously the state made a lot of argument, I'm sure, about that. Um, and while that is, those facts are much more, uh, well, they're just different. It was about the defendant's conduct after the offense itself, and that's... So it wasn't it wasn't what you thought, and I, I apologize if I misled you in some way. All right, so um, next witness is going to be Mr. Dunn. Yes, sir. Mr. Dunn, I need you to rate, stand up and raise your right hand again for me, please. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help you, God. Yes. All right, you can just put your hand down. You can stand there just at ease if you'd like. I need to go through a few things with you before you testify. And we've done this a little bit, but I need to do it again. Um, obviously, you recognize that this is a criminal case, correct? Yes, sir. And you understand what you're charged with, the five separate counts uh, in the indictment. Yes, sir. You understand, and we've talked about it at length, you've heard it said many, many times, that you have an absolute right to remain silent. You understand that? Yes, sir. That nobody can make you take the witness stand or compel you to give any testimony against yourself. You understand that? Yes, sir. Um, you understand that the state has the entire burden of proving their case against you beyond a reasonable doubt. Yes, sir. And so, as we've discussed before, I think it was the other day, and even Mr. Strollo alluded to it in his um, opening, perhaps, you, meaning your team, if you will, don't have to present or prove anything. The state has the entire burden of proving the case against you 
Um, and so you understand that. You can become a witness if you wish. If you do, then you will be treated like any other witness, meaning you'll be put on the witness stand, you'll be examined by Mr. Strola on direct, you'll be cross-examined by one of the assistant state attorneys or Ms. Corey herself on cross-examination, so it'll happen just like the other witnesses. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Um, I don't need to know the discussions between you and Mr. Strola, but um, experience tells me that there are many occasions where uh, a lawyer might say to their client, you know, I really think you need to testify in this case. And the client might feel differently. Uh, there are occasions where a client would say, I want to testify in my case. And the lawyer says, I don't think that's a good idea. There may be occasions when both of you are on the same page, either to testify or not to testify. Regardless of what Mr. Strola's advice or counsel has been, do you understand that taking the witness stand is completely your choice? It's an independent decision that you make on your own. You make it with advice, I'm sure, from maybe even family, friends, Mr. Strola, whomever. But ultimately, it's your choice to, to decide one way or the other what you're going to do. So my, what I'm told from Mr. Strola is that you have... Um, made the decision to waive your right to remain silent and actually become a witness in the case. Is that correct? Correct, sir. All right. And uh, you're making this decision to become a witness in the case um, independently of your own free will? Yes, sir. You're making that decision freely and voluntarily? Yes, sir. Nobody's threatened you or coerced you or anything like that to get you to waive your right to remain silent? Okay. Um, all right. Any further inquiry from the state? No, Judge, I did have one matter before we resume the jury. Okay. Well, just before we do that, so Mr. Dunn, have a seat. What we'll do is when we bring the jury back in, I'll ask Mr. Strollis if, if he's ready to proceed. He'll say yes. I'll say call your next witness. He'll call you. You'll come up. We'll do it just like the rest. You raise your hand. I'm going to have you do it. I know you're under oath, but I want it to look exactly the same. So you'll come up. Have you raise your hand, the clerk will administer the oath, we'll come around, have a seat, and off we go. Will I be doing that in front of the jury, Your Honor? Yes. I have a leg raise. Ah, okay. Well, uh, does the state have any objection to... him being over here already? No, sir. Do you want him already under oath, or do you want him to stand up over there and be sworn? I'll do it. All right, and then probably what I'll do, if you want, when we're finished with his testimony, we'll take a break. And that way he can get off the stand. That would be great, Judge. Okay. Your other matter. Judge, uh, the defense had filed a motion to eliminate prior to trial that the court had deferred ruling on. Um, and I wanted to address that in some respects now. And I think Mr. Stroll and I may be in agreement. Um, I don't know if the court still has it. It's entitled, uh, Defendant's Motion Eliminate Regarding Prior Comments, Acts, and or Similar. Uh, and what I advised defense counsel this morning is that I believe I should be entitled to ask the defendant that he believed that the people in that car were thugs based on you know what he had heard. He made a comment about, I hate thug music. I think I'm allowed to ask him that. Um, I don't intend to go further than that at this point unless for some reason he opens the door. But I think the motion was filed specifically regarding a number of other references or other terms that the defendant had used to refer to uh, the four teenagers in the car. I don't intend, like I said, at this point, to go further than that, but I did want the court's permission, rather than interrupt the jury, um, to okay. question him about the fact that he believed the people in the car were thugs. Okay, Mr. Strohl. Judge, again, it kind of goes to, it, it almost lets that horse out of the barn, but then goes to the heart of the issue when the defendant does open the door. I don't plan to elicit testimony of, did you hear the lyrics or anything like that? Obviously, those are testimonies that occurred the last day, occurred here. You have him take it right down and say thank you. And 
legal effect. Once the state that comes up and says, isn't it true you believe this? Clearly, he's not going to admit it. And then it's going to answer the door, not answer, open the door to other testimony. And now I might even have to come in for redirect. And it just becomes a slippery slope. Well, I don't see what other testimony it would open the door to. And I don't know either. And that's my concern. And that's that slippery slope. We're going into something. Well, let me say this. I think it's fair, uh, given what Miss Rower has said, that Mr. Dunn said, I hate that thug music. I think it would be fair to ask the question, you know, I assume somebody, they're going to say, you, didn't you say that? I'm guessing he's going to say yes. That's a different problem. I'm with you. And then I think a fair follow-up to that is, and so... You know, you, you thought the guys in the car were thugs, too. He can say yes or no. If he says yes, fine. If he says no, that's fine, too. I don't know where else they can go with it. Well, that's my concern, Judge. They, uh, we already know the police going to put on rebuttal. I don't want them to... Rebuttal's a different ball of wax. And that's we're not there yet. And I understand. And I haven't said what they're going to be able to put in yet, either. <laughs> and that's my concern. I just want the objection on the record. I think at that point, too, it's... Mr. Guy would have to clarify then at the moment you said, oh, I hate that thug music, is that when you saw it? Because that's the problem. That becomes that slippery slope. There's obviously a time frame involved of when he pulls up, when he hears the bass, when he makes a comment, when the crowd goes into the store, when he asks him to turn it down. I mean, there's a whole chain of events. And the problem is if you just throw out that generic question and he says, no, I didn't, then all of a sudden it's, well, didn't you make a phone call? Didn't you write a letter? Didn't you put a picture on your, your uh, jail wall that you don't like thug life? And then again, now we start going into that slope of they're going to try to bring things out. Well, that's Mr. Guy has said he's not thinking he's going there with Mr. Dunn, at least not at this point in time. Not to mention, apparently, I'm guessing your client's going to say that there was some conversation, to put it politely, between Mr. Dunn and Mr. Davis. And so... During the course of that conversation, I can see where the state would say, well, if you didn't think he was a thug to begin with, maybe you thought he was a thug after he said whatever it is he's going to say he said. And that, that's my concern. That, that's what I'm trying to avoid. If you want to scale up to a certain time frame, so arguments can be made and will be made so similar to what you're saying on this, but that's for another time. But it, my concern is we ask that question on cross, and then they try to then elicit other testimony after that. There's a very narrow time. Well, I would suggest you object to testimony after that because what the representation is at this point is Mr. Guy is going to limit it to that. And so based on his reputation, that's as far as I'm going to let it go, and I, I'm sure you too, so you'll object, and then we'll have further conversation. Hopefully we don't go there. <laughs> and then rebuttal is a whole other ball of wax. Right. Judge, I only have one. Hang on, let me back up. So the motion, that motion in limine is granted in part, denied in part. Granted to the extent that it talked about other things, denied on the thug reference. And that's based on the comment you said to Ms. Rauer that she testified to. Correct. Okay. And I suspect he's going to testify to it too. Maybe he's not. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. Your other issue? Yes, sir. Investigative costs. Yes, sir. I did talk to Mr. Hurt. What it was is he wanted to know how far they expended or where they are. As of Saturday, I think we went that full day Saturday. So it would just be for yesterday. Because obviously we're finishing today. I did still have witnesses outside. Obviously. You sure. Said do they was, know, do they have numbers? I mean, uh, have they itemized things yet? No, they have not. I, they, they did reach the 3000 as far okay. as Saturday. So Saturday and well, my, that, my suggestion was just have them, because uh, they'll be finished today, have them tally it up at the end of the day and just submit whatever it is. Absolutely. So you want to wait until obviously both sides Yeah, run. and then that way I don't have to put a, a, a maximum in there. I'm just going to put a number in there that, that covers whatever they did. Absolutely. And obviously I want to keep them for purposes of rebuttal. If sure. I have to look things up. So that was, I mean, if they're, that's here to, meant to do. if they're here through tomorrow, that's fine. Just tell them to do an, a Tell them, you know, give us a bill at the end of tomorrow or whenever. Absolutely. Judge, prior to any written answer, Judge? Sure.
Yeah, so we need to bring the people on in. Well, I'll just have him come up and get sworn right here, and then I'll have him come sit down, and then the jury will come in. All the rest of the people need to come on in here. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> 